Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today, we are going to hear about Harriet Hardy, Taylor Mill, and John Stuart Mill. Um, and we're going to be hearing from Helen Pringle. So thank you so much, Helen, for coming to talk to us about this. And over to you. Uh, thanks, Joe, And hello, everyone. Um, it's really lovely to be here talking again. I look forward to these times so much. Um, I'm, uh, just to begin, I acknowledge that I'm uh, I'm working in my office at the moment at, at the University of New South Wales, which is on Gadigal and Bedigal um, land to people. And we were just talking a moment ago. Um, I was just talking to Sheila and the others about next Saturday is uh, where in Australia we're voting on a constitutional change to um uh, enshrine, I suppose is the word, um, uh, uh, constitution, a voice, um, an, uh, a body that presents the voice of every, um, Indigenous or First Nations perspectives to the government. Um, the, it's a very controversial um, uh, topic. Um, what I want to talk about today was, and uh, was Harriet Hardy. Uh, so don't go there. Um, no, I'm not going there for the moment. I can go there another time. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was Harriet Hardy and John Stuart Mill and their writings um, on um, uh, their writings on what we might call domestic violence and what they had other terms for. And I'll talk about those other terms um, as we go. And particularly, I want to use use the word cruelty in relation to what they write about. One of the things that you might know about John Stuart Mill, who's the person with the big carbuncle in the forehead, and that's a very conventionally known picture of him. One of the things that you might know of him is that he um, he's beloved by conservatives, and I, I mean conservatives, um, right-wing reactionaries in particular, but um, other people as well, um, who are not so much, I suppose, on the left side of politics and tend to adopt a an absolutist position on freedom of speech, which they attribute to Mill. Um, Harriet Taylor was uh, her maiden name, as we call it. Uh, the um, birth name was Harriet Hardy, um, and but she's very rarely referred to as, as Harriet Hardy. She's often referred to um, more as Harriet Taylor. Um, uh, Taylor was her her married name um, and um, there's a lot can, that can be said and speculated about her <clears throat> her relationship with her husband. Um, there is some evidence to suggest, for example, that he was very cruel to Harriet, but also that he was one of the things in, in one of the ways in which his cruelty manifested itself to her was there seems to be quite um, quite compelling, but not conclusive evidence that Harriet um, had contracted VD from him. Um, and um, she, after she had a, again, I guess there's a, a lot of different views about this, but Harriet had a, a deep relationship, let's say, with John Stuart Mill for a long period from um, the end of the 1920s, uh, uh, sorry, the 1820s, not that far ahead. And uh, when Taylor died, eventually she married, um, she married Mill, so she became Harriet Mill. Um, she's often read out, uh, or rarely read into, I should say, rarely read into stories about Mill and discussions of Mill. So often people simply refer to John Stuart Mill um, without referring to the part that he himself attributed to Harriet Taylor as um, uh, um, that he his, his beloved wife, as he often called her, which he said that she was responsible for the better part of what, of what he wrote. I'm just going to turn the um, the next uh, slide on. Sometimes uh, a picture is shown. Uh, thanks, Joe. Sometimes a picture is shown of uh, of Harriet and um, and John Stuart Mill in this in this picture on the right, and you can see on a, a philosopher's version on YouTube they've captioned it as John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor Mill. Um, that in fact that the woman there is not in fact Harriet Taylor Mill, um, but uh, she is Helen Taylor who's a daughter, one of the daughters of Harriet from her marriage to Taylor. Um, I mentioned this as well in part just so that you don't go making a mistake about who's in the photo, but also um, that uh, that Helen Taylor um, 
was also given great praise by Mill and he often referred to her as being in part also the the author of uh, much that was good in his own writings. So she um, uh, she lived with him as as a daughter after Harriet Taylor died times that you've got there. One of the things that I think is is that I'd just like to nudge you out of is a is a sense that um, is a sense of Harry of um, John Stuart Mill, but also of um, Harriet Taylor insofar as she's in the picture at all, um, as people who were um, rather conservative. This is added to, I think, by John Stuart Mill's role and job at the British East India Company. Um, I can't get into that today, but I I do have um, thoughts about it and ways of thinking about that, not to excuse him, but um, simply to uh, to give a, a wider picture of that. And there is, um, in terms of uh, um, his perspectives on race, there are things that need to be um, explored very, very um, deeply and cautiously, I think. But for the main part, I, I often sort of say about Mill is that um, in the words of that song of the Irish song, Johnny, we hardly knew ye. You know, one of the things that I found when I first started to read or first began to read Mill beyond his main work, which was On Liberty, which he attributes the authorship to Harriet Taylor, was published after after Harriet had, had, um, had died. Um, but one of the things that, uh, that that book On Liberty is famous for is as a defence of freedom of speech and as a defence of a fairly absolutist position on freedom of speech, which is just everybody can say everything they like and should be allowed to do that. That's not my view, um, and I can explain um, that, um, but, uh, and I, but I'd like to say it's not John Stuart Mill's view either or that of Harriet Taylor. Um, so just to get you into the into the mood to in understanding um, John Stuart Mill, this is a passage from a letter of his um, on when he talked about the freedom of press. And he was, I'll just move along to the next um, slide, Joe. Um, in this letter, he was writing um, um, and also famous for for votes for women. But um, and the next one, if you can, sorry. There we are. Um, in 1848, at the height of the revolutions in, in Europe, Mill was much castigated by the London Times, the London Times newspaper, as being a radical. Um, and so very different kinds of criticisms were levelled at him then than were today. And when he died, for example, the the obituary of the London Times was so nasty and churlish that I I it's really kind of quite shocking in a way. It's a real stinker of an obituary. Um, but at the time of 1848, when the Times, when the Times and other newspapers were criticizing him, he said, I sympathize very strongly with socialists like Louis Blanc. He said, our newspaper writers, and especially those of the Times, ought to be flogged at a cart's tail for their disgusting misrepresentations and calumnies of such men, directly in the face of the evidence they pretended to found their assertions upon. And he said they should be whipped, and I would very, I would very willingly help to apply the cat, the cat's tail, um, to any one of them myself. Um, some of this is hyperbole, obviously, and not all of it was always unpublished uh, out in the out in the political world. But um, there, these are two other passages in his letters where he talks about um, what his view of of the present state of, of things in England were. And so here he's in the first one, he's arguing for a revolution. Um, I find this a bit, uh, for me, this is, this goes a little bit far. The word exterminate doesn't sit well with me, but I'll read it anyway. He says, I should not care though a revolution were to exterminate every person in Great Britain and Ireland who has 500 pounds a year. In other words, the rich, many very amiable persons would perish. He says, but what in the world, what, what is the world the better for such amiable persons? In England, on the contrary, um, he goes on to say in another letter, he talks about the necessity of a violent revolution being very much needed in order to give a general shake up to the torpid mind of the nation, of the English nation, which the French Revolution gave to continental Europe. Says, England has never had any general breakup of older associations and hence the extreme difficulty of getting any ideas into this stupid, into its stupid head in that way. So Mill was certainly um, not not given to temperance, I suppose you would say, in his writings necessarily. And he certainly, once you read 
all 24, 26 volumes of his of his collected works, I mean, including the one of the last ones, which is about plants, growing plants and botany. Um, but once you get through those, you realize that he's a that his writings and also um his character as well are very much more complex than we've thought. One of the things that I would then just point out again, just to give the um just to give the flavor of Mill is that um he he believed that he had had certain ideas before he met Harriet, but certainly they came to fruition when he met Harriet. The one thing that is very hard to do is to disentangle um their to disentangle their writings at certain parts. And when I when I'm going to be talking about these writings about cruelty, I think I'm going to use the the term um JH or something like that, just so that because I can't I can't possibly and there is no way, um, or at least with there with there is no way that we can find at the moment to disentangle which part of it is Mill's view and which part of it is Harriet's view and which part of it is um, written by one of them and which part is written by the other. And I think it would be, I think it would be interesting to know that, but at times Mill also says things like our hearts beat as one. Um, in other words, his, he talks about how they were inseparable in that way. But also he talks very um, amply and at, at length about how the work, if they weren't separated, it was Harriet who was doing most of the work. Um, now, there's a problem with that, I suppose, is that you'll say, well, if that's the case, why is On Liberty got John Stuart Mill on the cover and Harriet Taylor um, uh, not on the cover as the author? And I think that's a good question. I don't know the answer. But... What I would say, as a as a general um, as a general way of summing up these these writings of theirs together, which were very explicitly done together, they're the ones that we not just where Mill is talking about how much he learnt from Harriet or or whatever, but rather, and sorry if I if I sound um, uh, a bit friendly toward over friendly towards Harriet, and I, I feel I often feel um, very friendly towards her as if she's often can feel sad sometimes as if she's sitting there next to you um in that way which is a nice feeling in, for me at least but what i would say is that mill and um john stewart and harriet were they counted themselves as socialists they counted themselves as people who believed in the necessity of revolution they counted themselves as they a revolution as they understood it and Mill, as you can see, mentions a violent revolution. And they counted themselves as people who um, believed that in many ways the state had had gone off, had, was the problem. And certainly if you read discussions of Mill today, the discussion, the, the enemy, um, the enemy for Mill is thought to be the state. In other words, it is the state that stops us from doing what we want. It is the state that stops us from speaking freely. It is the state that does this and that and the other. And I think there is something of that in Mill, but I think it's a misjudged reading of Mill and Harriet, particularly in their joint writings, and that's what I'll try and talk about there, to get to the point where I want to say that for Mill, the most important thing, and for Harriet in their joint writings, the most important thing is the sovereignty of the, the sovereignty and the security of the individual and by the individual, primarily they mean, in this case, woman, um, because it was woman's sovereignty, um, women's freedom that wasn't acknowledged at the time. And they often talked about women at their time, in their time, being in the position of a slave, quite literally. And and I know we, we make fun of how people say literally, but that's that's what they talked about, that, that this was a that women were in the position of the slave. So when we talk about the sovereignty of the individual, it's not a sexless individual, it's not an ungendered individual, it is um, an, uh, a person who um, who is a woman in that way. So I wouldn't go so far as to say that, that Mill is a radical feminist. This is just, I, I can't just catching the tops of the comments, but um, I would say that it's somebody with, that we can learn from. And for Mill, the important thing is not to combat the state so much, um, which is a very, in my view, 
is something that we sort of grappling with all the time now and particularly in discussions about imprisonment and carceralism um, and the role of the state against us. So, so for Mill, the important thing is not to, and this comes out in the writings with Harriet as well, is not to make it so that the state is the enemy for always and ever, but rather the rather than focusing on fighting the state or smashing the state, if you like, um, what what they're both talking about is how to secure the sovereignty of the individual and how in particular to secure um, the the sovereignty of of women that way anyway I'll explain that but um and that that's a slightly that might sound like it's something of the same thing well you know what's the difference but it means that your focus is on is on um uh the security as Josephine Butler would also talk about as well the security of the person rather than on um, bringing down the state so sometimes the state can help us and sometimes it can't and doesn't, but it there. There's no call really here for a simple anti-statism. You know, we're against the state in that way. And for Mill, it was. Um, and I'll just talk about Mill broadly um, for a start before getting into in in just one second um, the the joint writings. So for Mill, that it was. Um, this was very. Um, clearly the centre of his works on freedom of speech in particular was the freedom of the individual and that um, uh, there would be, um, that that is the the test of any um, restriction on us is whether um, whether you are considering the liberty of the person as, prim as primary. Also, he is not concerned with harm so much, um, but he's concerned with... Uh, He's not concerned with the principle of harm, but he's concerned with the principle of the of security of the person. This has the this now this is a dig at male philosophers. Male philosophers tend to read on liberty, this work by Mill, and they say, and and I'm just I'm just gonna, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna pull any punches here. And they tend to say, yeah, so we read chap the, the book has five chapters. They tend to read chapters one and two and then shut up the book. And they don't read to the end of the book. And it's very common amongst male philosophers because they sort of think, oh, they've got the, the they've got the point, and so they don't need to read the rest of it. But in chapter five of On Liberty, which people rarely get to, the brotherhood of philosophers, philosophical brotherhood, and they rarely get to there. And if they did get to there, they'd find a discussion of slavery. So Mill says in On Liberty, people should be free to do as they wish as long as they don't. Um, and the test of of freedom is whether they whether they harm the interests of others or not. But Mill says, but he says, but look, the point here is that there's one further, there's one further line that we draw in the sand, and the line is on slavery. So Mill wants to say that you can't sell yourself into slavery. Now you can say, look, that's a pretty funny thing to say. Well, whoever thought of selling themselves into slavery, of consenting to slavery? But people do. They consent to enter a, a, a relationship of slavery in order, for example, to um, make their own life better or particularly to make their life of their children better. So where, and I'm talking about prostitution here, I don't think there should be any secret about that, is that we often say, why are, why are, you know, why do people, why do women make the choice to enter slavery, uh, to enter, oh, it's giving myself away there, to enter prostitution? And I mean, it's no, there's no secrets there, you know, it, it just because they enter that in order to get by, to feed themselves and their children every day, to actually live a life, some kind of life through the money they gain doesn't mean that, that, that the relationships that they're entering into and the relationships of the prostitution system are not slavery. And it's very clear that in, in international law, and in the European Parliament, um, in its 2014 resolution on prostitution, they say prostitution and forced prostitution are forms of slavery. It's no clearer than that. And for Mill, you know, simply because you consent to make that unchoice, thanks, Fiona, the unchoice to to um, enter the prostitution system or to to remain in the prostitution system, doesn't mean that it isn't a relationship of slavery. So, and Mill says this, this cannot, this can't be counted as a choice, as a free choice, because it sells yourself into slavery. He says by selling 
person for a slave. That person abdicates liberty. He, he uses he here, but I'll just qualify that in a second. He foregoes any use of it beyond that single act. Therefore, by selling himself for a slave, the person defeats in his own case the very purpose, which is the justification of allowing himself uh, allowing himself to dispose of himself. He's no longer free, and he has henceforth in a position which has no longer the presumption of freedom in its of choice in its favour that would be afforded by his voluntary remaining in it. The principle of freedom, he says, can't require that he should be free not to be free. So one of the things that follows on from that, because Mill isn't talking about slavery, he isn't talking about slavery in the sense of you know Cleopatra rowing the slaves down the Nile or whatever. He's writing against the background of the American Civil War, and he's talking which he um, was a partisan for for the anti-slavery side in that in that case. But even more than that. Mill makes very clear, and it's very clear then in the um, J.H. writings, the John Harriet writings, that he is talking mostly about women. At one stage, he says, it's clear, he says, that there are no longer any organised slaves in or slave trade in our society except for the subordination, the subjection of women. And so he says one of the, but but in that context, he says, we can't and we should not mistake acquiescence in a dependent situation as free choice. So if we want to respect others, mostly we say, I want to respect other people. So that entails respecting the choices that they have made in whatever conditions they have made them. I don't tell them what to do. I don't tell them what's best for them or what's in their own best interests, but I respect others by regarding the question of their civil status and their choices as closed and non-negotiable. When he's talking about slavery, when they are talking about slavery in this case, so getting on to the passages concerning both John and Harriet, um, they're not talking about uh, the American Civil War, which had ended at that time, and they're not talking about slavery, ancient slavery in that way. They're talking about cases like the murder of um, a woman, or the attempted murder, rather, of a woman called Mary Ann Watson in 1851. This is the evidence in her case, and this is um, this is a passage not from um, J.H.'s writings, but from the Times. So this is the account of the case. Early in the morning of the 4th of August, the persons lodging in the next room were disturbed. And sorry, this is a very upsetting case. The the persons lodging in the next room were disturbed by the cries of the prisoner's children. Um, the children were, and the prisoner is the man in this case, Lizzie, aged eight, and the younger child was aged three. And they called out to the neighbours, the two children, oh, father, let mother down. Um, the neighbours got up in consequence and went into the man's room where they found his wife hanging by the neck from the cupboard and the prisoner was, the man accused, was sitting on the bed. The body of the unfortunate woman was quite suspended and she was nearly black in the face. Upon the prisoner being told that he was a good-for-nothing villain for attempting to hang his wife, he replied that he would do it properly and effectually the next time. And one of the witnesses answered that he would have done it effectually this time if his wife had not been cut down. The, um, the accused was slightly intoxicated, it appeared, at the time of the occurrence. And the man accused in his defence asserted that his wife had hanged herself. Mary Ann Watson, the, the woman who was cut down, was not called as a witness at the trial of McLean, her husband. Um, she had previously been examined by the magistrate to whom she had claimed that she had spoken provokingly to her husband and also that, get this, and also that he had hanged her only in jest. Um, for Mill, that this... And later on for J um for J H, sexual slavery was the most powerful obstacle to widening the scope of freedom in his contemporary society. Um, there is no question that Harriet had held this view before she met Mill, and that she certainly pushed him along the road in it. Um, and they call this the almost despotic power of husbands over wives. Um, and argued that their that slavery, this slave trade, needed to end this slave system needed to end. Um, in his work, The Subjection of Women, which Harriet 
um, isn't on the cover, isn't her name isn't on the cover of, but um, it's clear that she wrote it as well. Mill argued that marriage is a form of unjust power and of slavery. He said the law of servitude in marriage is a monstrous contradiction to all the principles of the modern world and to all the experience through which those principles have been slowly and painfully worked out. He said the law of servitude in marriage is a sole case now that Negro slavery has been abolished in which a human being in the plenitude of every faculty is delivered up to the tender mercies of another human being in the hope that the other one will use the power solely for the good of the person subjected to it. Marriage is the only actual slavery known to our law. There remain no legal slaves except the mistress of every house. That was both the position, that was a position of both, of both Mill and Harriet. They come up and this is so familiar, and you'll know it's so familiar from um, from domestic violence cases in Australia, as where I am, and but it's in other cases as well, that there is a difficulty in bringing prosecutions, often because the women who have been assaulted um, will not give evidence, will not take part, and not merely that, but they will often come to the defence of, of the man who has hit them. So J.H. concede that women, women like Marianne Watson, caught hanging from the from the ceiling, he concedes that they do acquiesce in the system. When they say, he hanged me only in jest, they do acquiesce in the system. And he also says, that, uh, they also say rather, that women are not collectively rebellious to the power of men. But the fact that they don't rebel against the slave owners doesn't mean that um, it doesn't illustrate their freely adapted choices. What Mill and Harriet say in this case is that women are in the slavery of women is a very different case from all other subject cases. He says their masters require something more from them than actual service. Men do not want solely the obedience of women. They want their sentiments. All men, except the most brutish, which is not very many, if you read Mill's work, um, all men except for the most British desire to have in the woman most clearly connected with them, not a forced slave, but a willing one, not a slave merely, but a favourite, like a house slave in the slave system of the United States. The masters of all other slaves rely for maintaining obedience on fear, either fear of themselves or religious fears. However, the masters of men, masters of women rather, wanted more than simple obedience. They wanted women to... Um, completely subject themselves to the slave system, to their husbands. In such circumstances, um, both Harriet and Mill say that consent to slavery can't is simply disqualified as the act of a sovereign or individ, individual, independent individual. Consent or choice in those circumstances is is it's risible, laughable to talk about consent in those circumstances, but you can understand it as a measure to sell, to salvage some dignity from an intolerable situation. So they say, to those whom to whom nothing but servitude is allowed, the free choice of servitude is the only alleviation, though a most insufficient one. Its refusal completes the assimilation of the wife to the slave, and the slave under not the mildest form of slavery. For in some slave codes, they say, the slave could, under certain circumstances of ill usage, legally compel the master to sell him. But no amount of ill usage without adultery added in will in England free a wife from her tormentor. Um, he's, if Mill says, and Mill and Harriet say, if married life were just all that it might be expected to be, looking at the laws alone, society would be a hell upon earth. The fact is that the laws aren't the only thing that go to to make their um, a state of slavery a hell on earth, but they are how the laws are interpreted as well. Um, I was just I'm a um, family history. I do a lot of family history and genealogy, and I was just looking last night at some um, records of some of my family who emigrated from Scotland to the United States in the 19th century, and the records of their marriage and divorce, and one of the things that struck me about it was um, the phrase that was often used in a divorce, which was um, cru cruelty that goes beyond the, <laughs> sorry, I can't remember the exact, the exact phrase now, and I'm not laughing at uh, 
at, at its trivial, at its at its funniness, but um, at its ludicrousness as well as its cruelty. But um, that it you could get a divorce on the grounds of cruelty that went beyond the usual in that way, something, some phrase like that. And I, I mean, they page after page after page of these divorce records with that written in the in the corner, and mostly the wife, but sometimes the husband, complaining but uh, making a complaint for divorce and also with when the women complained about beyond the usual cruelty, they often also complained about um, desertion or refusal to support. So um, there was cruelty across the board, if you like. It wasn't, um, it wasn't just uh, related to physical cruelty in that way. I realised that that was probably the, probably, you know, why so many people complained of that was because that was the, the phrase under which you could attain a divorce where you couldn't attain a divorce if it was um if it was less severe than that but um but still i mean that that very notion that there was an acceptable level of cruelty and that if you went beyond that then then divorce was available to you um you'll find that these passages about sexual slavery about the slavery of women and about the slave trade in women um are rarely alluded to in um in discussions of freedom in mill and even more rarely mentioned in discussions of freedom of speech or, or discussion. Um, these are, but they're collected, um, the the importance of that context in understanding freedom of speech in particular, as I'll get on to right at the end, um, is crucial in understanding what Mill says about freedom. And those the way that that can be most or best most clearly understood is in a series of articles that Mill wrote with Harriet Taylor and Harriet Taylor wrote with Mill in the 1940s and 1950s uh, sorry again I'm still skipping ahead a century in the 1840s and the 1850s the articles concern military justice they concern the abuse of children others concern the vicious ill treatment of servants um, but most are concerned with or make mention of men's brutality to their wives as well um, in the cases at issue um, that brutality was invariably brought to the attention of the police, not by the women who'd been assaulted or targeted by their husbands, but by neighbours. And you find that again and again in domestic violence cases that um, it's the neighbours who complain. There's too much noise. And so the neighbours complain to the police and they are the, the complainants in these cases rather than the women themselves. Hopefully things are changing a little bit, but I, I know... Um, I know that these kinds of this this pattern of complaints by other than those who are assaulted continues. There are sorts of reasons for that. Um, it's not necessarily an irrational um, um, view. As I said before, if you want to eat, if you want to put food on the table for your children and a food and a, a roof, then um, one of the things that it can be rational to do is not to complain. One of the most startling of these newspaper commentaries by... Um, um, H J H or H Day is on the case of William Byrne, who was brought up on a charge of cruelly beating his horse. Um, again, fairly uncommon to be to be charged with that. The magistrate heard that he was that Mr. Byrne, William Byrne, had a wife and family to support, um, and the magistrate released him with a small fine on learning that 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 was the case. Mill infers that because Byrne beat his horse. He probably also beat his wife and family, that is, his slaves, as he calls them, as, as Mill and Harriet call them. They say, disgusting enough it is that animals like these, and he's talking about William Byrne, not the horse here, disgusting enough it is that animals like these should have wives and children, and disgusting that merely because they are of the male sex, they should have the whole existence of these dependents under their absolute control as slave masters in any modern slave country have over their slaves and without even the wretched compensation of supporting them. So again, that sort of pattern of cruelty, but with very few mitigating circumstances. But they say, Harriet and Mill say, but as if all this was not enough, the man is told by a magistrate that because he has a family to ill use, he may indulge himself in ill using any other creatures who come in his way and may practice on them the amiable propensities of which his family are to reap the full enjoyment. I just note here quickly, I can't go into this, but um, Mill was a, um, Mill was a very, um, Mill wrote a lot about um, cruelty to animals as well. And um, one, he wrote so much and was considered so highly in this that um, the RSPCA, RSPCA, I think, um, the 
uh, the Royal Society for the Protection of Cruelty Against Animals, um, actually invited him onto the board. He said in response, this was after Harriet died, he said, thanks for your invitation to be on your board, but I won't join the board until you start targeting the cruel blood sports indulged in by the aristocracy, like hunting of animals and um, bird shooting, pigeon shooting, for example, he said, as and give as much attention to those forms of cruelty by the aristocracy as you give to those to the forms of cruelty against animals by the, the working classes. So in that case, in the case of William Byrne, um, Mill and Harriet argued that real, if you wanted to respect the wife and children, you would have you would have spoken um uh, there would have been spoken a very different language to the magistrate. So again, there he's talking really about how we talk about these things as well as what is done. And he says the different, and they say, and that different language would have elicited a very different punishment on burn from the small fine that he paid. That was in um, that was in um, 1846, the case of um, William Byrne. I um, looked up the, the, to see if, what happened to Mr. Byrne, um, William Byrne, and he appears to have been still whipping his horses in 1851 when he was fined and sentenced to two months hard labour on that charge. So he got a bit extra that time. But in the report of his 1851 charge, which is in the London Times, not in noted by Mill or Harriet, um, there's no mention of his family. So I was very pleased to read that because I sort of thought, I hope they got away in that way. Um, in an anonymously, in perhaps the the... The central um, central article in this series on cruelty was an anonymously published, um, it had neither Mills nor Harriet's name on it, um, uh, 1853 pamphlet on the Fitzroy Bill, which was to dealing with cruelty in that way. Here, Mill and Harriet argued that a culture of impunity applied to domestic, what they called domestic atrocity. Um, they said that punishments meted out for personal violence were gravely insufficient. In regard to sexual slavery, Mill and Harriet choose their terms very carefully. The terms used by Mill and Harriet there, which talk about domestic atro atrocity and ruffians, don't, I think, don't have the force that they, for us, that they did for Mill. For example, I might characterise a student's spelling mistakes as atrocious, as an atrocity, whereas for Mill, atrocity refers, Mill and Harriet, atrocity at that time refers to a horrible or heinous wickedness. In a civil, um, um, for example, people called conservative writers called the uh, killers of Charles I, the, the regicides of Charles I, they called them um, that uh, uh, atrocious, the, the, the killing was atrocious, and they referred to them as ruffians. But, you know, I might call my son's friends a bunch of ruffians, uh, but I mean they're scallywags or not that they're low and brutal characters or cutthroat villains or swaggering bullies in the sense that Mill and Harriet meant the word there. What's more, for Mill and Harriet in this crucial pamphlet on the Fitzroy Bill on cruelty, the argument that they made was that flogging is the appropriate punishment for crimes of brutality. And I'd really like to talk about this um, at length at another time, but for people like me who are sort of grew up on the left and remained on the left as a student and still in most ways consider myself a woman of the left, even though, you know, I'm not so keen on some of my fellow comrades on the left, people like Owen Jones, whatever his name is, um, but, um, or Billy Bragg, um, <laughs> ruffians. But, um, but I think that we people on the left in particular have a horror of physical punishment, a horror of capital punishment and a horror of physical punishment. And that must come into, I mean, it can't help but come into it what you read when you read what Mill and Harriet say here. They say, for crimes of domestic atrocity, nothing will work, nothing will be effectual, but to retaliate upon the culprit some portion of a physical suffering which he has inflicted. They say, overwhelming as are the objections to corporal punishment, except in cases of personal outrage, it's particularly fitted for such cases of personal outrage. The repulsiveness to standers by and the degradation to the culprit, which make 
corporal maltreatment so justly odious as a patient as a punishment rather would cease to adhere to it if it were exclusively reserved as a retribution to those guilty of personal violence it's probably the only punishment which they would feel those who presume on their consciousness of animal strength to brutally ill treat ill treat those who are physically weaker will be made to know what it is to be in the hands of a physical strength as much greater than their own as theirs and that of the subjects of their tyrant. Again, he calls the, the, the husband a tyrant. Mill and Harriet say, flogging is the moral medicine needed for the domineering arrogance of brute power. And they say an enactment to enable flogging for domestic violence would do more for the improvement of morality and the relief of suffering than any act of parliament passed in a century, not accepting perhaps the act for the abolition of slavery. Now, when I read that, I have I have a lot of trouble with that. I kind of think that's, you know, I don't agree with physical punishment in that way, or I didn't. But not not so much because of reading these passages by Mill and Harriet, but recognising the extent and the systemic nature and the systematic nature as well of the violence that's the force, the cruelty that's perpetrated against women and the sexual cruelty that's perpetrated against them, um, I have, I'm not as, my mind isn't as set as it used to be about opposition to physical retribution or even to the death penalty in the case of child child abuse. Um, so while I can't say I'm a, you know, I'm a proponent of, of capital punishment now, I'm not, but I, I find that argument not as, not as uncongenial, let me put it that way, as it as it used to be to me. It'd be interesting to to talk about that. And I also find that sending that when we talk about carceral punishment, sending people to prison, I think that sexual violence and gendered violence in the sense of violence perpetrated by men against women is something for which I think has a special category in terms of understanding what ought to be done about it. That you know, abolishing prisons or abolishing the state or abolishing the police simply doesn't isn't the isn't the solution to sexual and gendered violence by men against women. I really like to talk about that sometime, but um, I just don't have anybody to talk about it here because where where I am at university, everybody's anti-carceral, etc. Um, but in these and similar passages about flogging. Um, Mill and Harriet take the view that the law, and particularly criminal law, is an instrument of moral education. And they say this is that which exercises the most powerful influence on the character of citizens and particularly of men. What is even more striking that um, is that Mill thought that this use of the criminal law in order to repress one of the most odious forms of human wickedness is not open to discussion. So both Mill and Harriet write about this. They say not only is education by the course of justice so flogging is a form of education, then it's the most efficacious of all kinds of popular education, but um, also one in which there needs to be no difference of opinion. Churches and political parties, they say, may quarrel about the teaching of doctrines, but not about the punishment of crimes. There is a diversity of opinion about what is morally good, but there ought to be none about what is atrociously wicked. Whatever else may be included in the education of the very people, of the, people the very first essential of it is to unbrutalise them and unbrutalized men they mean and to this end all kinds of personal brutality should be seen and felt to be things which the law is determined to be put down to put down rather and which there doesn't need to be discussion about in the sense of in the sense of um i mean we can he's not saying we can't talk about that they're not saying we can't talk about that but they're, what they're saying is this is kind of ground zero for a discussion um so their picture of the law as a moral teacher includes the makers and administrations of the law, like citizens, legislators, judges, juries. Um, in a different uh, different context, Mill, writing by himself, reiterated this point. He said, the laws are the great schoolmaster. What shapes the character is not what is purposely taught so much as the unintentional teaching of institutions and social re relations. So here they're, they're recasting what law and the state are and talking about them as educational institutions so when we say we shouldn't use the law but we should use education they would reply by saying the law is a form of education the punishment of the law 
is a form of education and the only form of education that will work in the case of men's violence against against women. So according to Mill and Harriet, the lenient punishment meted out to uh, meted out for brutality to the slaves called wives is in contrast to the severity of punishment for property offences. Um, in one of their articles on cruelty, um, Mill and Harriet talk about how there's a disparity between um, there's a disparity between the punishment for property crimes, which is very um, the punishment is very harsh, and for crimes of personal violence, especially violence towards women, where the penalties are are not very are not very high at all. They say mankind could go on very well, have gone on in time past, with property very insecure if property is insecure, but subject to blows or the fear of blows, there can be no other than soulless, terror-stricken slaves without virtue, without courage, without peace, with nothing they do, they they dare call their own. So what they're saying here is that what's most important in terms of understanding our, bearing our perspective towards law and the state and government is the freedom and sacredness of human personality, especially of those who don't have it at the moment. If you don't protect human personality by the state and the criminal law, then freedom is is just a um is just a feel where power, not truth, holds sway. And this is the case, this is as um they argue, the two of them argue in regard to the case, to another case of Mary Ann Parsons. It's a terribly sad case of a servant um who was killed for property for stealing. He said the ordinary protection of law is protection to those who can help themselves, who can in general keep themselves out of harm's way, or at least who can tell their own story. So security and freedom and sacredness of human personality is about being able to tell your own story. I think it's also, if I could just add a little bit here, this is not in Mill or, or Harriet themselves, I think it's about imagination, imagining your own story as well. Imagining a story of something that you can be as well as what you as what you are imagining what your life could be if it were um if you were respected if you were not a slave in that way um but mill and harriet say that more than the the ordinary protection of law is required for those who can't tell their own story those who like mary ann watson the woman hanged who stand trembling in the courts unable to speak the truth with sufficient plainness to procure a conviction or to adhere to it when it has been spoken in the first instance. Lastly, the the one final, there's a lot of these cases, I'm not going to go through them all, obviously, but um, one of the last cases that's pretty crucial in this, in this context is a case um, concerning a policeman. Um, the policeman was called William Smith, and he arrested Patrick McGovern, who'd knocked down a woman late one night on a London street. Smith, the policeman, struck McGovern with his truncheon in an attempt to protect her. Guess who was brought before the courts? It was, of course, not Patrick McGovern who knocked down the woman. It was Constable Smith who had defended the woman. He was brought before the magistrate who sentenced him to a month in prison with hard labour for what the magistrate called an unprovoked, brutal and unjustifiable assault on Patrick McGovern. Smith was dismissed from the police force and he was not reinstated despite protests made on his behalf, including by Mill and Harriet. This story involves a fairly standard incident of what we call domestic violence or domestic atrocity in Mill's terms. What makes it atypical, untypical, was the action of Constable Smith in coming to the aid of Eliza McGovern, knocked down by her husband. What makes it also untypical is that it came to public attention and was the subject of a newspaper report. And Mill and Harriet note, for every such case that excites notice, hundreds, most of them as bad, pass off in the police reports, entirely unobserved. And for the one that finds its way, even for that brief, brief instant into light, we may be assured that not hundreds but thousands are constantly going on in the safety of complete obscurity. Correct. Tick. The newspaper report on William Smith came to the attention of Mill and Harriet. Um, they were... Uh, um, oh, sorry, in, in came to the attention of Mill, who was at that time living in France just after the death of, of Harriet. Mill wrote um, to the uh, to the Attorney General and wanted to um, complain about the harshness of this of this sentence upon the, the helping policeman. 
Mill said here in his letter, I am not a partisan of the police. On the contrary, I greatly distrust the police and I think that magistrates rely too much on their evidence and often treat instances of bribery, perjury and other highly criminal conduct on their part with most undue, undue lenity. I think that's a statement that we can't, I mean, it's hard to disagree with that. Who, who would say, I am a partisan of the police? I trust the police all the time. We don't trust the police and we don't, there shouldn't be a blanket trust in the police or a blanket partisanship of the police. It's quite right, I think. But he says, can there be a worse lesson to the police or to the public than that when so many are retained in the force after flagrant misconduct, one poor man against, them who, against whom there is no other charge is dismissed for a little excess, excess of zeal in protecting a woman against gross ill treatment. Policemen, he says, will think twice before they will interfere, interfere again to protect men's wives or any other woman against brutality when they find that any hurt they inflict on a brute of this description is declared from the seat of justice to be not only brutal and unjustifiable, but unprovoked. Knocking down a woman in the street being no provocation to a bystander, even to an appointed and paid preserver of the police. In other words, it teaches the lesson, he says, that a woman is a creature whom it's safe to knock down, but most dangerous to defend from being knocked down by another man. Mill, in this case, knew that Smith's, the Constable Smith's action was atypical. Um, he replied, he fully acknowledged that in, in other letters around the time. He was concerned, Mill was concerned by this time with how the case would influence men's judgment on what it was wise and just and prudent to do in regard to women when you find one when you find one as your wife. This incident of the policeman is a way, I think, of refocusing what we think about Mill and what we understand about Mill. So instead of um, that accepted, relatively conservative view of Mill as um, putting forward a statement that I can be the person I want to be, I can tell the story I want to tell about myself if I am free from the intervention of government or society, nevertheless, in some cases, what he's arguing is that in some cases, the intervention of the state and even the intervention of the violence of the state is the only means of educating men into vaguely proper treatment of women. So Mill was suspicious of the state. We can be that too. He was no partisan of the police. And again, I think good very, we shouldn't be partisans of the police, but nevertheless, we can understand that the state is not always the enemy, that we can understand that it has a far-reaching and even a coercive role in enhancing the equal standing of women with men. So what I want to suggest here is that um, the argument of, of um, Mill and Harriet and of Mill himself when he was by himself is founded not on setting the limits of government. That shouldn't be our aim either, of setting the limits of government, but understanding how to protect and nurture and flourish the status of persons and the status of persons being able to speak in their own voice, being able to tell their own story, being able to imagine their own life um, in ways that they simply can't when they're treated as like slaves in that way. Um, Mill also, just to finish here, Mill also acknowledges one thing that I think is very important, which is that slavery is accomplished not only by actions, actions against people, but that it's done or performed through words. Um, in, in a really stinging passage against Thomas Carlyle, um, who Mill was sort of vaguely a friend of, his father was a friend of, which was um, in, in which Mill had defended the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, Mill talked about him as having done a true work of the devil. So even defending, when you defend domestic violence, when you defend sexual violence against women, and here you might sort of think, who does that? Who defends domestic violence? I can't begin to tell you how many people do that. They defend it usually not in the sense of, you know, saying it's all right to do it, but they defend it usually now in the sense of saying, um, it's not so bad. So there was a, a little thing on social media I was reading yesterday about involving, oh, I forgot his name now, you know, I'm sure you know the person I'm referring to, he's the the American fellow who's gender critical, but thinks that women just belong in the kitchen. I forget what his name was. 
yes and and like sarah says she asked for it what did she do and that's that sense of not not taking it seriously enough so in this little exchange between this american guy i'm sorry i can't remember i'm sure you know who it is matt walsh thank you it is matt walsh and then he um uh, one of the people replying to him said oh we make too much of rape there's too much anguish and you know stuff about rape it's just it's usually just something that it doesn't even last very long in that way and i kind of think you know having read so many rape cases both in international law and in domestic law in england and in um in australia that's such a false idea of uh, it's such a false picture of what happens and it's also such a false picture of of the systemic nature of sexual violence and of violence against women in our society. So Mill is asking us really here not, you know, to play our part, not to, not to, I mean, I know most, I, I'm, I'm speaking to the, to the converted here, of course, but to that things are accomplished and that subordinate status that we remain in as women is accomplished not only through actions, but through words, not only through crude violence, but through the cruelty of words as well. And when we begin to understand that, then this is just le leading off for the moment, then we might begin to understand how to, how to think clearly about the freedom of speech as well. Oh, I'll finish there. I'm sorry I didn't leave much time for questions. Um, so, Helen, there aren't any questions in the Q&A, but that you, you might look a little bit through the chat and uh, if anybody's mm -hmm. got a direct question... Um, if you put it in, but I, I've got a question which may be reasonably yeah. simple to answer is, did Harriet Taylor call herself a feminist? I don't think that was a term current at the time. I'm open to open to correction, to complete correction on that. But I, they, um, one thing that I, I, I wouldn't mention, no, I, I, so my answer is no, I don't think so. But I don't think that that was something that anybody called themselves at that time. Again, sorry, sorry if I'm I'm wrong, and I and if I am wrong, I'd love to be corrected. I really, you know, really would. But um, at one stage, they in the, I think it's in the autobiography, Mills' autobiography. He says Harriet and I were decidedly socialists, and we there were two things that we thought would signal the reformation of the world of civilization. Um, to use Nonica's phrase there, two two things that would bring that about would be the emancipation of women and the um the socialization of of industry. So I I mean I th yeah, that's that's all I can say. But I think that there was no question and and again I think this is something that we just we we don't get from most people writing on Mill. You know, unheard. There's an article on unheard about Mill recently, and Open Democracy writes about it, which is a disgrace. Um, and as as with most things that they write about, but um, you know, they they all they they read Harriet Taylor out of these questions, and they read sexual liberation, sexual emancipation out of out of this as well. Mill and Mill talks about sexual violence. Mill and Harriet talk about sexual violence as well. Um, in subjection of women, I think Mill talks about how, you know, the the law as it's constant as it's constituted at the moment allows men to do just about anything that they they want to women, and if they, except kill them, and if and he says, and if they're tolerably cautious, they can kill them as well, but he says, for example, they, the law allows allows he mentions right the 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 example of rape in marriage, that that's what a husband is allowed, and um, right. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, we've come to the end of the webinar um, today. So um, there's a breakout room if anybody wants to go to it. And um, we're, we're hopefully you'll come back soon, Helen, to carry on. Tell us more. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And um, thanks for listening. And, you know, I, I and sometimes I, um, I'm on Twitter and I'm on and I, I'm kind of Googleable, Googleable. Um, if you ever want to, you know, send anything or tell, correct me or, or anything, just please get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. Right. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.